Well, tonight we are in Exodus 14. We're going to finish up verse 15 to 31. I hope you have a Bible. If you don't, you can raise your hand and we will get you one. But last week we took the time out. uh, There's a lot of videos on YouTube about uh, what we looked at, but uh, looking through many of them, I came to the one that I showed last week, and it's on our website now, that I really think does lay out uh, the most likely way it went. And there's two fingers of the Red Sea. The one finger, the first finger closest to Egypt, the Suez finger, if you would, and then the other, the second, the smaller, the Aqaba. And it does appear that that makes sense in so many different ways that it would have been there. And then when they crossed over the Aqaba, that would have put them into Saudi Arabia, as it is to this day. Um, and um, yeah, you, you, when you go to Aqaba, and I have been there a couple of times, um, you go from Jordan, you go into Jordan and you go to Aqaba, you're on the Jordanian side, but then if you go, whatever that is, I think north, then it's the Egypt part, and then there's the Saudi Arabia part, and then all the way down at the very, very end, excuse me, there is no Egyptian part, there is the um, Jordanian part, and then the Israeli part, and the Saudi Arabia part. Uh, of the Gulf of Aqaba, and they're in Elat. Um, It's a beautiful little resort town. And at one time, it did have uh, a navy, Solomon's navy, uh, that was put there. But either way, I I think that hopefully gives us a picture in our mind as we go through the next few chapters, really the next few books, uh, with keeping that map in our head. And I'll show it again and again. But... um, as we remember, this whole picture of Exodus is a picture of eventually the Messiah taking us out of bondage. It's a picture of the, his chosen people being taken out of the hand of Satan, Pharaoh, out of Egypt, the place of bondage, of slavery. But when we follow the Lord, then we're now able to walk and follow him and to live in freedom. And of course, it didn't really happen in the Old Testament. Um, It was simply a a, a picture that was not clear. You know, we think of Jonah. We say, oh, Jonah, the story of the faith. But Jesus says, no, that's actually a picture of me. As Jonah was three days and the three nights in the belly of the fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. It was a prophecy of Christ. And so in the same way, we see that last time we ended in chapter in verse 13 and 14. I want to look at that again. And Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Number one, two, stand still. Number three, see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. So I love those stories, you know, where the Lord just says, stand still and watch the light, Lord fight for you. But first he says, don't be afraid. And again, they were terrified as the Egyptians are coming down fast at them and they're trapped in uh, between Migdal and Pyarihoth. And they're there at the Red Sea and there's nowhere to go. They've been trapped in. And of course, the Lord told Moses, this is a part, this is going to be a test for them. And and, and the Lord says, stand still. Don't don't be in despair. Don't fear. Don't be impatient. Don't be presumptuous. Just stand still and let the Lord work this out for you. This is God's plan to do all the work. You just to stand still and let the Lord do everything. It's not always that way. Sometimes the Lord has them fight in the battle and strengthens them. Um, but in the, there's these cases, and of course, these cases in particular have the picture of salvation. That's how we are saved. We stand still. The Lord fights for us. The Lord does the work of our salvation. And then we just receive it as a gift of God as we walk by faith in it. And I love that. I'll fight for you. And these guys, these demons, 
really satanic, Satan and the demons in a world full of chaos and bondage and wickedness and slavery, you will never see that again. Well, in the rest of this chapter, we're going to see four more things God's going to do. He's going to move them by a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. He's going to part the Red Sea. He's going to trouble the Egyptian army, and then he's going to close the Red Sea over top of the Egyptian army and kill them. Well, in verse 15, and the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. But lift up your rod, stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. In verse 17 and 18 now. And I indeed will harden the hearts of the Egyptians and they shall follow them. So I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over his armies, his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. So Moses, <laughs> you know, in front of the people, he's trying to look solid and, and like he's not worried and being afraid. But the children of Israel cried out to God, remember? And th then they started complaining to Moses. <laughs> We should have let us, we would have been happy to live in Egypt. We were content there. Matter of fact, we loved it there. What did you bring us out here for? You know, they, and, and Moses privately cries out to God and, and his heart is as weak as theirs. They're crying out, but they're terrified. Moses is crying out and he's terrified. And, and in essence, God is saying, hey, 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 why are you in essence, being affected by the fear everybody else has, as if you also are afraid. Don't, don't be one way in front of the people and another way when you're away from them. Be that same man of faith. So, so it, it's not a time. There, and there is a time when really it's almost a sin to pray when we're supposed to be acting. You know, um, Jesus has some pretty harsh words about the Pharisees and their prayer life and not having action. You know, James points out how they go to church and they worship and worship. And then when a poor brother and somebody from church is suffering, they close their heart to them. And he's saying that they don't mix. <laughs> and so in the same way, there is a time to pray but then there is a time where God has clearly said, this is what you're to be doing. And it would be wrong to say, let's just pray another hour when you're to be acting on what God has clearly showed you. Now, I want to make this clear because I've had people, all kinds of people say, the Lord showed me this. And, and it was like, uh, I don't think the Lord showed you. Oh, yes, he did. And the fact that you're questioning me, I rebuke you, you know, and it's, and it's like, and everybody else needs to do what I, the Lord told me to do. All of you are to do it too. And that's why I'm like, hold it. <laughs> that's presumption. Okay, that's not walking by faith. But when, when God says, like he told Peter, step out of the boat, it, you know, he needs to not sit in the boat praying, so to speak. He needs to get out of the boat. And this is exactly where they were. Uh, the Lord is said, hey, there's no more prayer meeting necessary here. Take your rod, stretch out your hand, and let's see a miracle. And indeed, that's exactly what happened. Now, I, 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 later on, remember where they say to Jesus in John 6, they said, well, what are you going to do for us? <laughs> now, Moses gave us manna in the wilderness. Remember what Jesus says? Moses didn't give you squat. My father gave you that manna. And that manna was me. And so again, to say, oh, the rod of Moses. In other words, if I could find the Ark of the Covenant, <laughs> me and Indiana Jones, and I could somehow open that up and pull Moses' rod out of there, which is inside that thing, I don't think it would part water, right? Right? I don't think I could go to the Red Sea today with Moses' actual rod and 
you know, say Shazam or whatever I'm supposed to say, and, and, uh, and the waters would part. Moses' rod did not part this water. God did. But he was using Moses as, I don't know, a, a symbol, a, a, you know, arrow, there it is, a, you know, like a traffic arrow saying, go this way. So he was sort of the pointing instrument. <laughs> this way, we all need to start going. And then by the, the, the word of the Lord, by the, the command of God, sure enough, they opened up. But remember, it wasn't Moses. It wasn't the rod. Those are things that God used. Like, remember in Matthew chapter 9, where the woman who had the hemorrhage for 12 years, it says that she purposed in her heart that if she touched the hem of Jesus' garment, the tassels that would come off the Jewish robes, that I would be healed. And the whole multitudes were flocking in on Jesus, and Jesus stopped. I like the old King James. It says, and virtue went out from me, Jesus says. But I don't know how that happened. It wasn't from me, it, but it did come from, from me, but I didn't initiate it. And he starts looking around, and it became evident to Jesus and everybody that this woman had touched him. And what does Jesus say to her? Your faith has made you well. It wasn't Jesus' tassel. It wasn't the magic garment. It was God who did it as she put faith in the Lord. It's important. Then the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when this begins to happen. He ends there in this passage by saying this. And now in verse 19 and 20, and the angel of the Lord who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus it was a cloud and a, of darkness to the one and a light by night to the other, so that the one did not come near the other all that night. So it sounds like the Egyptians could have caught up with them that night in which they were crossing. They actually crossed at nighttime until the wee hours of the morning. And it sounds like it was very possible that Pharaoh could have been on top of them at any moment. But God hedged them in. I love that. First, God hedges in Israel before and behind. He's in front of them, behind them. So you say, how did they all get across? You know, God was hedging them in. God was moving the whole thing along. But then that which gave light to God's children brought darkness to Pharaoh. That which brought comfort and God's presence to the one stopped the other in their tracks and they couldn't do anything because of that demonic presence, that hard-heartedness and that pitch black night unto them. There was no light. I love that in 2 Corinthians 2 where where Paul actually says, you know, when we share the gospel, who's sufficient? To one, it's life unto life. To another, it's death unto death. Who is sufficient for these things? And here you have the same God at the same time revealing himself to people who did not know him. The Egyptians didn't know him, but let me tell you something. Israel didn't know him any better. God was, was new on the scene for not just the Egyptians and Israel, probably many other countries represented there as well. We do know there was a whole host that left with Egypt, or were left with Israel, those of the Egyptians and many others, they did believe. But yet it, it is a heartbreaking thing. We actually talked about it last Sunday morning there, where they would not believe the love of the truth. So God sent them a strong delusion that they would believe the lie, that they would indeed be condemned. 
And so um, here we see the same thing. So now as we think about this passage and we read certain passages in the Bible, they, they make a lot more clarity. I think of Psalms 109, how David, 139, how David takes from oh, so many different stories in the Bible and doesn't represent that he's talking about that, but he clearly was. And in Psalms 139, verse one through four, he says, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down. You're acquainted with all my ways where there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. Now, verse five, you have hedged me in behind and before and laid your hand upon me. That was the scene that night. God had hedged them in. The enemy wasn't going to catch them. God had hedged them in and hedged Egyptians out. And it was a firm uh, protection of God's hand that night. And yes, the impossible happened. The Red Sea opened up. It became dry ground. And then they were all able to keep moving in this smooth, continuous motion, God giving strength to the elderly, God picking the pace up of the, of, of the kids, and, and God causing the strength for all the animals and everything to move in calmness and swiftness. And, and, and no doubt all the people getting from point A to point Z in one night was a miracle in and of itself. It was all a miracle. There were tons of things that were causing a miracle. Well, in verse 21 now to 22, then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord caused the sea to go back by the strong east wind all that night and made the sea into dry land and the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on the dry ground and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Boy, I know when I, I do watch the movie there, the old one with Charleston Heston, it is, it gets me every time when I see that. It's like, whoa, I did not, that's awesome. That's, it's awe, you know, it's like, whoa, that would have been, an amazing scene. In Hebrews eleven twenty nine, the author writes it this way. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. You see, the provision were for those who believed. But soon as those who don't believe in the Lord try to experience the blessings and the promises that God has given his people, it brings them into destruction. Isaiah, I think he was thinking again about this and other passages in the Bible as he wrote Isaiah 53. But boy, as you look at it again in the light of this passage in Exodus, look at Isaiah 43, one through five. I want to read the whole chapter, but I won't. But just chat to the first five verses there. But now, thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob. He who formed you, O Israel. Isn't that true? He made Jacob this hill catcher, but he formed him to becoming one who's governed by God. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. Remember, Jacob's name was changed to Israel. So in essence, God is saying, you've got this guy that he hardly see any good fruit in his life at all. I mean, he's a stubborn, hard-hearted, difficult guy from A to Z. But God is saying, oh, you're mine. I love that. And then look at verse two now. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, though they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Listen to this. I gave Egypt for your ransom, or in your place. Ethiopia and Siba 
in your place. That would be the story of Asa in 2 Chronicles 14 through 16. Since you were precious in my sight, you have been honored and I have loved you. Therefore, I will give men for you or in your place again and people for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. God is, is saying, you're mine. Anything that tries to come against you, I see them as a lion that I will kill. I will see them as something I need to destroy. Even though you're rebellious and sinful and hard-hearted and difficult, and, and so, uh, so was Israel. Of course, I was, the first, I was talking about you guys. But so was the nation of Israel. Um, God is saying, even though that's our human nature, that we are not like everybody on the earth. We have a special standing before God as his chosen ones. He'll give other men in our place, as he did Egypt and Ethiopia and Siba and many others, that we would be saved. Well, in verse 23 now to 25, and the Egyptians pursued and went after them in the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. Remember, he had 600 choice chariots, and then all the other chariots. He, he, went, he pulled every single gun and bullet he had out of the, uh, the holding place. Everything, everything came out. Every spear, every, bear, every soldier, lacking nothing. He, of course, when you think about it, he didn't need hardly anything. These people weren't armed. These people weren't an army. They weren't a military. They didn't know how to fight. It was a bunch of women and children uh, were more in number than, than the men. And the men, they were terrified of the Egyptians. They, they had been living for hundreds of years, seeing themselves as subservient to the Egyptians. So the, seeing them in their regal uniforms and their chariots coming after them, I don't think they would have said, I'll take that chariot on. <laughs> I think they, they would have cowered like a slave, like they were. But yet he, he was bringing everything. He wanted to slaughter them all. A complete holocaust. In verse 24, Now it came to pass, in the morning watch, the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud. So here, he's looking down through the pillar of fire and cloud, darkness to the one, light to the other, protection for the one, uh, keeping the other away. And he troubled the army of the Egyptians. He took off their chariot wheels. Now God's just having fun. He's laughing. This is just, this is just God being funny here almost. So that they drove them with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, this is important, let us flee from the face of Israel for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. What did God say to earlier to the Israel? I'll fight for you. Even these hard-hearted, wicked Egyptians could see. We're not fighting against Israel. We're not fighting against men. We don't have a chance. We need to turn around and get out of here because it's, we're fighting against God. Wow. The realization of that seconds before they die. I just can't imagine the sober realization in that moment. And of course, God did a lot of other things too. We, we learn in Psalm 77, verse 17 through 20. It says, the clouds poured out water. So it wasn't just the seas folding over. That was sort of the final thing, the walls of water falling. At first, they were being just pummeled by this incredible torrential rain on them that came pouring down. Then the skies sent out a sound, maybe like thunder or maybe trumpets, I don't know. But the skies making this incredible sound as the rain is pouring down. Your arrows, God's arrows, also flashed upon them. So it sounds like lightning is hitting them, right? The voice of your thunder was in the whirlwind. So the pouring down rain, the loud noises, lightning coming, whirlwind. 
this incredible wind coming and the lightning, um, lightnings lit up the world. So these lightnings just, you could see it all like a big giant flash of light. The earth trembled and shook. Underneath them, it was an earthquake happening. Your way was in the sea, your path in the great waters, and your footsteps were not known. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. So it really does sound almost like God was standing in the middle of the Red Sea himself. They really were fighting God. And God there just has lightning and rain and thunder and all kinds of other sounds and earthquakes going on. It, it was an awe moment. And, and somewhere either before this or as this was just starting, the, these people of Egypt realize, wow, we're fighting against God. They got it. It reminds me of a few other verses. Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. Their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. 2 Corinthians 1.20 For all the promises of God in him are yes and in him amen to the glory of God through us. So in other words, this is an isolated. What God would do for one kid, God would do for another kid. In Romans 15, 4, for whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. In other words, yes, God works differently at different dispensations of time, but nevertheless, God is working powerfully on our behalf as well. Well, verse 26 here, down to 28. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians on their chariots and on their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And when the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth. And while the Egyptians were fleeing into it, so the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. Not so much as one of them remained. So it's the wee, out of the mor- wee hours of the mornings as they're finally crossing over into the other side of the Red Sea into Saudi Arabia. They're all standing, looking back, and they're getting glimpses of what's going on. <laughs> they see the lightning and... <gasps> Oh, it's filled down there. There are so many soldiers, so many chariots, and they're coming successfully on dry ground towards us. Another lightning bolt. They see what's going on. Then they start seeing the rain and the lightning bolts and the whirlwind and the earthquake. They're watching all of this happen. And God says, Moses, you get to be a part of this. (laughs) Stretch out that rod again. This time, to not open up the waters, but to close down the waters that had been open. So Moses stands up and uses his rod again, and now the waters come closing in, and not one Egyptian remained. We're finishing up here. But the, in verse 29 to 31, but the children of Israel had walked on dry land in the midst of the sea, And the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. They're seeing just all these bodies washing up. Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done to Egypt. So the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and and his servant Moses. So the rod and Moses standing there, a lot of that was that people would respect Moses and listen to Moses was a part of it. But they came to have this awe and reverence for the Lord, which they should have had a year earlier. But it's, it's getting clearer to them. As they are now out of Egypt, 
the Egyptian army that terrified them for the last 430 years is now dead. And they are on the other side of the sea and no enemy anymore is after them. No more slavery for them. No more Pharaoh killing their baby boys. Well, what do we learn here today? I think a lot of things. Number one, we need to always remember God has a plan of deliverance. Again, how does that look? We just covered this last week in 1 Thessalonians, the end of chapter 2 there. In verse 34, it says in Hebrews 11, by faith they were saved from the sword. But in verse 37, it says by faith they died by the sword. By faith, they won military battles, and by faith, they lost military battles. By faith, they could sleep with lions all night, and then by faith, lions ripped them to pieces in the Colosseums. How is the end story going to look? I don't know, but I like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember what they said to Nebuchadnezzar? Can your God deliver you from that fiery furnace? Yes. Is he? Uh, we don't know. We, either way, <laughs> we're not going to see your unbelieving faith like this ever again. And sure enough, when they did see Nebuchadnezzar, his faith was not unbelieving anymore. Secondly, God wants to work it out. So you see him clear and trust him more. God doesn't just have a plan. God has the plan. Next, and number three, God's plan will bring glory to himself so all believers and non-believers can see he is our salvation and to be born again. I, I wonder if some of those Egyptians did believe in the last seconds, if we're gonna see them in heaven, like the thief on the cross who was cursing Jesus, why on the cross with the crowd? But yet in that moment, he realized Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I, I, I wonder if some of those Egyptian soldiers in the last moments go, you are the God. <laughs> you are the only true God, the God of Israel. And God counted that to them as righteousness. I wonder. But either way, everybody was in awe. Israel was in awe and the Egyptians were awe. Everybody got it. I don't, I don't think really there was not one unbeliever. Um, in, they may have been hard hearts and wouldn't trust the Lord for salvation, but they all understood who God was in the last moments, even the Egyptian army. The next thing is, number four, don't fear, but trust and step out in faith. Once God has clearly said it, again, not presumption, but once God has clearly made his will, we need to act and step out in faith. And the fifth thing is, one day we will cross over for the final time. Those who have not turned to Jesus and believed will be judged by God for an eternal destruction. So one day we're going to cross over the final time. And that's why I wanted to end.